Intravenous cannulas have become a ubiquitous part of medicine. While in today's day and age, it seems almost impossible to imagine our world without these little tubes, few of us stop to wonder how these tubes actually came along. Well, we did. And here's what we found. There are five important milestones in the advent of the IV cannulation. The first milestone was the idea that transducing blood from a young man, robust, full of strength, to an old man, thin, emaciated, will rid the old man of his problems. In 1492, Pope Innocent VIII suffered a stroke. A medicine man, the best in the business at that time, came forward with a brilliant plan to transfuse blood from three young, innocent, healthy boys into the Pope. In a grotesquely genius operation, he connected the veins of the boys to the artery of the Pope and allowed nature to take its course. Unfortunately, the Pope and the three boys died. The medicine man, who was later revealed to be a Jew, was smeared for his actions and had his name erased from history. In the 16th century, similar ideas were documented in the first book of chemistry ever published. The book, called Alchemia, was written by a German naturalist called Andreas Libavius. Whether or not he performed these experiments is questionable. Nothing happened for the next 100 years or so, till the 1600s when the second milestone took place in England. A medical student by the name of Christopher Wren designed the first IV cannulation set. He performed the first IV infusion using a quill and a pig's bladder and the infusate he used was a mixture of wine, ale, opium and antimony. Seeing no future in this endeavour, a frustrated Christopher Wren left the medical profession. He went back to his love for architecture and began designing churches in and around England and today over 50 of the churches he designed are still standing. However, the merits of IV therapy were not lost on Christopher's friend Richard Lover. This is when the third milestone happened when he performed the first animal to animal transfusion between two dogs. When the news of this transfusion and its effects reached France, a French mathematician and philosopher Jean Baptiste Denis performed the first animal to human transfusion in 1667. Nine ounces of lamb blood was transfused to a man suffering from madness. Dennis provided detailed notes in which he explained that the patient initially tolerated the treatment well. However, on repeated transfusions, he developed adverse reactions. Eventually, the wife of the patient took Dennis to court. The court, lacking insight into the nature of the adverse reactions of blood transfusions, misunderstood the situation and convicted the wife of poisoning her own husband. This incident also resulted in the ban of such transfusions in France. In England, however, Lower continued his experiments and in 1668, he performed a live transfusion between a dog and a human in front of the Royal Society in Oxford without any adverse effects. Inspired by this success, Lower began working on the technicalities. However, England too followed suit with other European countries and banned transfusions, so IV therapy came to a standstill for about a century. The fourth milestone came with the first successful human-to-human -human transfusion. In 1818, a British obstetrician named James Bundle transfused blood to a pregnant woman from her husband and did so without any complications. In addition, he invented new tools like the impeller which infused blood under pressure and the gravitator which infused blood with the help of gravity. So now the scene was set. Blood transfusions were known. IV access was possible, but unfortunately there was no real use for this technology. It just seemed like a fancy procedure with no use. The breakthrough in IV cannulation occurred with the outbreak of cholera in 1831. People, rich and poor, lay in the streets incapacitated. Overcrowding and industrialization added fuel to the fire. Primitive treatments like bleeding the patient, administering brandy and breathing nitrous oxide were fast proving ineffective. Then, Dr. William Brooke Shaughnessy observed that a large amount of water and alkali was being lost in the patient's stools. He theorized that pumping salt and albumin with water could replace the lost fluids and revive the patient. Thus, the normal saline infusion was discovered. However, Dr. Shaughnessy never implemented this treatment. 
A year later, Dr. Thomas Latta, a student of Shaughnessy, began doing infusions of normal saline when cholera struck Paris. Dr. Latta witnessed a miracle recovery in his patients. And so, the IV revolution began. From then on, almost weekly advances were made in the field of IV cannulation. Revolutions in the technique and instrumentation were phenomenal. Metal reusable cannulas gave way to plastic cannulas which were reusable, which were replaced by today's plastic and Teflon cannulas. This is how IV cannulation became central to every single healthcare facility around the world today. Hope you like this video and do check out our other videos. To get regular updates, like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel.